After you have successfully delineated a watershed, it is essential to evaluate the characteristics of said watershed. The first characteristic to be evaluated is the watershed area. Watershed area is defined as the quantity of land which drains to a specific point of interest. As you recall from the Burbank Canyon delineation, we delineated a watershed to an outlet point, which was the reservoir. Now we will measure the area to that given outlet. This can be done by putting grids over the watershed area and counting the squares, knowing the size of each square. The data can be brought into CAD software and measured based on a scale. It can be done in GIS. In addition, it can be done using a planimeter. A planimeter is a tool which allows you to determine the watershed area using a device similar to this, shown in the image. Next characteristic is watershed length. Watershed length is defined as the point along the main channel from the outlet along the channel all the way to the watershed divide, as shown. In some cases, you may see that the channel or the watershed divide could have taken two routes. When this occurs, you must use your engineering judgment. I suggest you go to the highest peak location. So again, it's defined as the distance measured along the main channel from the outlet to the divide. Next is watershed slope. Watershed slope is the change in elevation with respect to distance along that principal flow path, or watershed length. It is defined as the change in elevation from E2 to E1 divided by the watershed length, as shown. Slope can be a significant factor. This can suggest how quickly water will move out of a watershed and, and into another system. Next, we have watershed shape. Basin shape is not usually used directly in hydrologic design. It is used significantly by hydrologists, watershed scientists, and those potentially outside of the engineering realm. However, it is a very useful for conceptual concepts. We can have a circular watershed or an elliptical watershed as shown in the schematic. Runoff from a circular watershed will come from various parts of the system at the same time, and so the system will peak quicker. While in an elliptical watershed, runoff will be more spread out over time, and you'll have smaller peaks. To calculate the circularity ratio, you need to know the perimeter of the watershed and the area of the watershed. If the circularity ratio is perfectly 1, you have a circular watershed. Another useful term is the elongation ratio. This describes how, how um, long or how much we're stretching that watershed. The elongation ratio is the area over pi square rooted times 2 divided by the length. Again, if this is 1, we've got a circular watershed. Pause the video and take the time to prove to yourself that both of these equations would be 1. Put the circumference of a circle for the perimeter and put the area of a circle for the area term. And you will notice that everything will cancel out and you will be left with an answer of 1. Next, we have land cover. Land cover is a very useful concept. As we increase impervious surfaces within the watershed, we will result in a higher level of peak flow. Higher peak flow rates and volumes will result in flooding and potential downstream impact. In addition, higher impervious factors will result in quicker response of water within the watershed. 
meaning you have less time to decide or make a decision. So our travel time is much shorter. On the other hand, a pervious surface, similar to the one shown in the first figure, will have a higher degree of infiltration. And so you note, as the surface becomes more and more pervious, you go from a potential 50% infiltration to only a 15%, and in some cases even a 0%. You're going to have longer travel time due to infiltration and roughness. Why? Because water will move slowly through the watershed when it's in contact with vegetation and grass. The longer travel time will result in lower peak flow rates, lower volumes, and lower overall flow rates because the water has a tendency to be absorbed by the environment around it. Next, let's discuss surface roughness. Surface roughness is measured through the use of the Manning's equation, as you recall from a hydraulics or open channel course. Flow rate is a function of the cross-sectional area, the hydraulic radius, and the slope of the channel, or in this case, the surface. Hydraulic geometry is important so you can actually quantify the area and the wetted perimeter of your surfaces. I've provided you with general calculations of that. It should be noted in the equation, if you see an M, that is a Z. So in the triangular section under area, it says MD squared. It should say ZD squared. Next, soil characteristics become a very important thing to understand in hydrology. Soils vary based on the amount of sand, clays, and silts that are present. When we are looking at soil characteristics, we think of clays as being as being, as being composed of particle sizes less than a D of 0 0.002 millimeters. However, if the di diameter is between 0 0.002 and 0 0.02, we're talking about silts. And if the particle is between 0 0.02 to 2 millimeters, we're talking about sands. This will affect how, how water is absorbed in the environment. This should be a review from Geotech, but if you have 40% sand, you would read it this way. If you have 20% silts, you would read it this way. And if you have, as a result, 40, 20, that's 60, that means you'd have 40% clay, you would read it this way, and you would see where they intersect, and they should intersect perfectly. I, I have my 20 at the wrong spot, but it'll intersect perfectly, and this would tell you you have clay soils. Next, let's talk about channel characteristics. The first channel characteristics to think about is channel length. A channel length is defined as the blue line stream shown in a USGS topographic map. It is defined as LC. Drainage density is the ratio of all total lengths within the, cha within the watershed divided by the watershed area. This includes all tributary channels and side channels. We'll discuss this more in class to clarify the concept. Next, we actually can quantify a number stream ordering through Horton's Law. Horton's Law was desi designed to understand how a river system branches. The more or the higher the order is, the larger the system is. For example, a single stream will have a first order. This means there are no tributary channels. If there are two channels that combine, both channels are defined as first orders, while once they combine, it's a second order. If you have a system where you have two, a first order, a first order, a first order, a first order, resulting in two second orders, when you have two second orders meet, you have a third order. 
However, it should be noted, if a second order and a first order stream intersect, you will just have a second order. If you had a second order, a second order, and a second order all intersecting, so three channels coming in at the same point, you would just have a third order. It would not jump to a fourth order. It's important when you're looking at channels to be very clear about pictorially what you're seeing. So the top, what you're seeing is a top view or a plan view of our channel system. You see that there's a bridge. The dashed line represents a floodplain. There's a bike path. There's a low channel that you'll, you're seeing with drop structures inside of it. Drop structures are a way for us to control the river. So now we can look at a cross section AA and you can see that that, may, that little channel in the middle where the drop structures are located is kind of where that low flow is. The two year system is contained. You have a bike path. You have a hundred year that's where those that dashed floodplain lines are. You can see a, you can see a um, you can see a profile view of the river, and you can see the drop structures in the bridge and how the 100-year flow rate might look within it. So these are important things to know about a channel system. Next, continuing on on surface roughness. So we talked about Manning's, rough, Manning's equation as a review, but roughness becomes a big thing. When you have channelized flow, your flow depth is pretty high while in sheet flow, your flow depth is relatively low. As a result, your roughness is a lot lower in channelized flow than in sheet flow. It can be on the order of 10 times larger. So we can say that in the channelized flow, my roughness is 0 0.03, while in the sheet flow, my roughness is 0.3. The water is contained in channelized flow. However, not so much in a sheet flow. It'll spread. And the volume, or the velocity, is quite high in channelized flow and has the tendency to have higher potential, while in the sheet flow you have lower potential. This information should provide you with an overview of watershed characteristics. We will discuss this further in class and clarify concepts and work on example problems that will help solidify what's happening.